Uh, well, that's what I said. It's either going to be like, you know, you'd think it would be maybe a tadpole stage or, you know, just so far advanced that I wouldn't even want to deal with this. But, I, you know, whatever. I, I, you know, it's part of our, it's part of our, um, it's been part of our culture for a long time now yes. that, uh, that uh, there, you know, is life on other planets and that we're supposed to be scared of it. <laughs> that would really kind of uh, mess up what we read in, in, in the Torah, though, wouldn't it? A little bit? I don't, I don't know that it would. I mean, it definitely wouldn't. It, I don't think, I've said this before. I think, I think intelligent life on other planets, uh, intelligent life on other planets, if there's any kind of life on other planets, like even we're saying bacterial life, wouldn't necessarily do anything to any religion. Intelligent life on other planets that's been in existence for thousands and thousands, millions of years, let's say, is a problem for some religions. It's definitely a problem for, it's definitely a problem for Christianity. It's probably not so much a problem for, for Judaism and, um, and Islam, uh, probably not a religion for many, East, uh, problem for many Eastern uh, faiths. Uh, Judaism would probably, again, Orthodox Jews would, would say that the Torah's, that the, I think that's me. Huh. did say it was me, uh, but it wasn't ringing on my phone. Um, the Torah, you know, the the, the, the ultra-Orthodox Jews would say that, look, the Torah is only talking about life on our planet. Because uh, it says, that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It could be, again, re reflecting just what would be here, which has already been postulated by Orthodox uh, rabbinic sources in, in, in other, you know, so far in, in theoretical discussions. Again, for those who are, who are jo joining us late, we're uh, discussing the uh, very interesting. You know what I think would be interesting if there is, if they do, if they are here, is to see what, if they have a religion and if they believe in if some. They if they have a religion, if what their religion would be, yes. Uh, right. Judith was just saying the Voyager just went into the asteroid belt. Yeah, you know the thing about about Viger, Viger as we call it for Star Trek fans. For Viger, uh, yes, it's it's the weird thing is is that um, by the time like it gets out to the places that we were hoping it would get to, hopefully we'll have gotten there, and you know we're we don't forget about it, but. But um, it'll be interesting to see if we go retrieve it and say, hey, here you are. We threw you out into space, uh, you know, 100 years ago, and now we've caught up to you, and, and we can do it really fast now. So it would be interesting to see what would happen. But again, and I just thought it was interesting that Israel was involved in this amazing story today. So, Okay. It's what I read. I don't know when I read it. Yesterday. So it made the news, it hit the news today. I guess it was in Israeli papers yesterday. And as I mentioned, these were in trusted uh, sources in Israel. So this was not, these were not world, world, world news, whatever, world, news of the world daily. So now we know what's in, the, in Area 51 then. Bacteria? Sounds like we had to move out to Mars now to get away from prying eyes. Uh, look, I mean, again, it's really interesting though that, that his point was, if I come forward today and talk about it, it's not really going to shock anybody because we've seen such weird stuff happen that like, like if somebody told you the aliens are coming tomorrow, I actually thought about this just totally randomly, not randomly, maybe not randomly, uh, unconnected to this over the weekend. I, 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 I thought about those jokes about people talking about, you know, what weird things are going to happen in 2020, you know, the aliens come and, you know, like everything that's happened. Now this will happen. You've seen there's been millions of those, you know, and the last one is the Cleveland Browns win the Super Bowl, you know, and that's those things are happening. I mean, Cleveland Browns are in the playoffs right now. So uh, if they're stopped today, anyways, the, the interesting point is that if it happened now, people would be a little less surprised, scared. I don't know. Who knows? Anyways, maybe they brought the coronavirus. <laughs> I hope. Speaking to that, that, please, everybody, be very careful. I uh, just ten minutes ago was talking with our own Dr. Mike uh, from 
our synagogue uh, from Valencia Peds. And Dr. Mike was, was with um, Dr. Nish, who's a lot of our, not mine, but people I care about, uh, OBGYN, but he's also the chief of staff now of Henry Mayo, by the way, for those who don't know. Dr. Who, Nish? Nish? Of staff. Picture right there in Henry Mayo. Yeah, he's a super nice guy. Very, he's a he's a really nice guy. Doctor Nish uh, told told Mike that they are upside down at Henry Mayo. So understand that in our in Doctor Mike's world, our, words, our little corner of the world is under siege right now. And he said they've run out of not just beds, but they've run out of IVs because every IV. I never thought of this. Every IV pull for a uh, Corona patient. Um, they have f four IVs on every on everybody uh, who's, who, who's got it. So they've run out of respirators. They've run out, or they're running out of respirators. They're running out of IV IV poles too. So it's uh, very very serious. And he says they're seeing younger people there who are not dying but who are in the hospital. And so uh, his his definite warning was we are in the midst of this right now. We're going to be in the midst of it for another good week, probably two. I mean not, not for not, not a little bit, but for two more weeks, we're going to have to be very, very careful. So please, again, limit your exposure. And, and uh, again, I know a lot of people have gotten it and are not sick, but you know, some people are. And according to Mike, some people are getting it and they are uh, getting very sick and they're and they're on the younger end of the spectrum. So keep that in mind. Uh, I had that conversation only literally ten minutes ago. So. Um, I know everyone here is getting tested and being careful, but don't give up now. I mean, we're close to getting people vaccinated and getting people hopefully through this spike. But he said it's a it's a law, it's a graph, it's all scientific. And Mike, by the way, is not a panicker and he's not a and he's not a he's not political either. I mean, if anything, he's he's on a kind of a, on the more right side of that of the political spectrum. He will tell you don't don't mess with this. All right, everybody. So in the meantime, we've got Hanukkah and we're, we're, as I said, trying to make it as fun and as, uh, as freilich, as we say in Yiddish, as, as uh, joyous as possible. Um, and we've got uh, about 55, 60 people signed up for bingo already for, for, uh, for this weekend. Uh, you can just join. You can come on. You don't have to play. You can get the cards. I know a lot of you already are playing, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And don't forget, uh, starting Thursday night, every night at six o'clock, we're going to have a special Hanukkah lighting with Wendy singing and some other songs. Uh, and it's going to be really fun. So please join us during every night of Hanukkah at six o'clock. We'll post it up. You can watch it afterwards. So you don't have to be there right at six, but starting at six every night, it'll be up. And uh, our big service on Friday night, where we're going to do our Pasha, our Pasha painting loaded. party, at family of the year, and um, our painting party, which is for the sisterhood. Which is, anybody can anybody can paint. It's just oh, sponsored by the. Sisterhood. I thought it was only for women. No. No. Really? Really? I mean, it's going to be mostly women, but. <laughs> I happen to know of one husband who is planning on assisting, not mine. <laughs> but um, if you guys don't know, it's Pino's palette. They're going to do a, a Zoom painting lesson. Last time we went, uh, gosh, a number of years ago, we had such a good time. This time it'll be, uh, there'll be a take home kit and then we'll be um, uh, online painting. If you wish to have a libation at your own home, you may. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Seven o'clock on the 15th, that's Tuesday night. Even people out of town can participate. It's up there on the screen right now. There it is. If you wish to participate and you are out of town, we need you to sign up sooner as opposed to later because we will send it to you. We want, you know, we love having you guys with us, you far away people who insisted on moving and... Um, <laughs> I, I signed up already for the a sisterhood Hanukkah party up here, so I uh, can't, but I would have otherwise. <laughs> fine, Diane, I guess, your new community. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've got- but Yeah, so please, even if you're out of town or unable to 
to pick up your, your painting, we will get it to you one way or another. But if you do need it mailed, we need it in the next day or so. Please join well, us. It's going to be got uh, with those commercials out of the way, we're going to get started. But but we really do. We, we, we've been working really hard to bring Hanukkah excitement to everybody. And, and uh, look, you know, it's going to be tough. Um, we, there's a lot of stuff we normally do. And, and uh, you know, we're we're doing what we can. And uh, with that, I'm going to pop up onto the big screen. Today's text which is going to um i promise for those who were here last week um i promised you we were going to get weird today uh not just weird we get weird every week but this is actually as you can see right from the beginning i'm gonna make it a little bit bigger uh this is um it's gonna get bloody and it's gonna be a couple places you're gonna see some stuff in here that um, um, is kind of grotesque. That's a good word for it, grotesque action. Um, so when we jump in here, again, to remind people or to help people who were not here last week, what we finished with was uh, Zipporah, um, meeting Sipora at the well, Moses meeting Sipora and meeting his father-in-law, Jethro, who we learned is a Midianite priest from the Torah. And, the rabbis have to figure out how's that kosher? How, how did that wedding go down? Um, and they do. They basically say Jethro had already left his idolatry and was an outcast by the time that Moses comes into the picture. And his own daughters were suffering for his giving up, his tra his, his uh, essentially excommunicated for his, for his heresy against the idolatry of his people. Again, the Midianites are descendants of Abraham, but they're they're not Israelites, and they're not assumedly they're not monotheistic. So Moses uh, meets uh, Zipporah, and um, again, we read also about the uh, Ethiopian Moses is the king of Ethiopia, which was a strange thing that's not in the Torah, but we mentioned it's in Josephus, it's in. It's in um, it's in the apocrypha. It's in the midrash. It's a it was a common story that Moses had this kind of time as a as a as a royal leader, either in Egypt or in Ethiopia, or a combination of those. And that's what we read last week. And what kind of the well, what the Torah tells us is that Moses that 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 the king of Egypt that was pursuing him that that he was fleeing from died and that there was a new king now the problem of course is that that kind of begs the question well okay so moses now has an opportunity to go back but the rabbis ask a question which is a fair question what was life like for the average israelite in egypt at the time with this new pharaoh and that's where we're going to take it up today so rosemary are you up for yes. I can read. All right, thank you. The latter years of Israel's bondage in Egypt were the worst. To punish Pharaoh for his cruelty toward the children of Israel, God afflicted him with a plague of leprosy, which covered his whole body from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Instead of being chastened by his disease, Pharaoh remained stiff necked and he tried to restore his health by murdering Israelitish children. He took counsel with his three advisors, Balaam, Jethro, and Job, how he might be healed of the awful malady that had seized upon him. Balaam spoke, saying, you can regain your health only if you will slaughter Israelitish children and bathe in their blood. Jethro, averse from having a share in such an atrocity, left the king and fled to Midian. Job, on the other hand, though he also disapproved of Balaam's counsel, kept silence and in no wise protested against it. Wherefore, God punished him with a year's suffering. But afterward, he loaded him down with all the felicities of this life and granted him many years so that this pious Gentile might be rewarded in this world for his good deeds 
and not have the right to urge a claim about the beatitude of the future life. Keep going, a little bit more. In pursuance of the sanguinary advice given by Balaam, Pharaoh had his bailiffs snatch Israelite babies from their mother's breasts and slaughter them. And in the blood of these innocents, he bathed. His disease afflicted him for 10 years and every day an Israelitish child was killed for him. It was all in vain. Indeed, at the end of the time, his leprosy changed into boils and he suffered more than before. Yeah, so a couple things going on here. Uh -oh. The first is, uh, again, the question is, what was life like for the Israelites um, after Moses left, after the killing of the firstborn, um, what happened? And the rabbis put out there that life got actually worse didn't get better. It actually got worse in the last days before Moses comes there. That like, you thought that king was bad, it gets even worse. And so where the other king, you know, was killing babies, this one was not only killing babies, but, but bathing in their blood. I mean, this is grotesque. I mean, this is horrific to imagine. So, um, I mean, this is a very clear example of how the Midrash goes to a very, very dark place to try to, again, remind us of how horrible the experience in Egypt was. And if you thought it was horrible, it was even worse than you thought. So this is pretty horrific. Now, again, there's a couple of things going on here, which is that God punished Pharaoh. I mean, this is what the Midrash says. You got to follow the logic here. God punished Pharaoh for killing the firstborn, or the not the firstborn, killing the children, killing the, drowning the, the, the babies in the Nile, the male children. And so he punished him with leprosy, with a skin disease. Well, then he decides because of the advice of Balaam that he's going to kill babies to fix it. And so that makes it worse. And now we're left with, um, we're left with this uh, horrific cycle of Pharaoh is uncomfortable. He's, he's in pain, but it just gets worse. Now, of course, why do we have this story? Because we have the plagues. We have the story of the plagues. And the rabbis kind of asked this question, why did it just start when Moses went? And so they have this interesting midrash that, no, it happened before. But maybe it just affected, it maybe it just affect, affected the Pharaoh. Um, so that's a weird little, like, it didn't just start when Moses got there kind of thing. And, and so there's these themes that we've had already, we've seen, we saw them last week with leprosy. You know, that either Moses was leprous or the Israelites were leprous. Here, it's, it's the opposite, that Pharaoh is leprous. And that his leprosy eventually becomes boil. So it's, again, it's probably not leprosy in the sense that it's not Hansen's disease, but it's some kind of skin disease that the Bible talks about, which in its worst form would become boils, which of course is one of the plagues, right? So it, it's, it's um, like a foreshadowing of the plagues. It's also, again, picks up this theme of the three counselors, right? The three wise men, Balaam, Yitro, and Job, one being bad, one being good, and one being in the middle. The one being in the middle being Job, who Again, the rabbis threw that in there to explain another issue, which is how does this guy Job get punished when he doesn't seem to deserve anything? Well, the rabbis just gave us a reason why he deserved to be punished. It's because he kept his mouth shut, which again is weird because that's a pretty serious thing. If 
that's what he did because there is something he could have done. He could have done what Yitro did. But again, the Torah, the rabbis are teaching us that if you stand silently and don't do anything, when someone's getting, you know, when, when injustice is happening, you will get punished. Now, again, it explains that he gets everything back and Job ends up having a happy ending. But he asks that question, did Job really ever do anything bad? And they say, well, yeah, he did. So again, it's this theme of the three people who are, we know, by the way, none of them are Israelite, right? So these are three people that we know of in the Bible as important people, wise people or powerful people. And so we place them there. Um, and then, of course, uh, Yitro, who's the good guy, who uses this as an opportunity to get out of Egypt and go to Midian. So that gives us a backstory on Yitro, connects him to the story. Um, and Balaam, we know, is, is just an evil guy who ends up being killed in the Bible by the Israelites after, after he turns out to bless them. But he, he doesn't want to bless them. He was hired to curse them, and he's forced to bless them. So Balaam, as we mentioned before, is always held out as kind of the ultimate evil wizard, the evil sorcerer who uses dark arts and who uses powers. He uses the force, but he uses it in the wrong way. So Balaam is kind of universally very powerful, uh, recognized in the, in the Midrash as, as a powerful guy, but he's dark. He's on the dark side. Um, and they, they did that because, look, in the Bible, it says he's powerful. He does have divine power. And so the rabbis took that and then gave him a, a, a even darker backstory. And we mentioned that um, he has two sons named Giannis and Yambres. And as we mentioned, uh, Giannis and Yambres are... are in the Midrash and in the Apocrypha are the magicians, the wise men, uh, the counselors, the courtiers who confront Moses and Aaron and do battle against them. And they don't, they're not mentioned in the Bible. They're not mentioned in the Torah. They are mentioned frequently in the, in the post-biblical texts. And you know what? I did a little research. They are in fact mentioned in the Christian scriptures. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a quiz. They're, I just want to say this. They're mentioned in two, they're mentioned in two Timothy. <laughs> two Timothy. I just Isn't wanted to say, Timothy? I just wanted to say two Timothy. <laughs> it was so Timothy. easy to do. It was so easy to do, I but it is, it is. I just read Timothy. That, yes. It's, 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 uh, it's the two of them are mentioned in, uh, in, Second Timothy of the uh, the book, they're mentioned as people who stood up against Moses. It doesn't say Moses and Aaron, which I kind of like. In the Midrash, they're like the Moses and Aaron versus, it's like a tag team wrestling match, two guys versus two guys, kind of balances it out. But they're actually mentioned by name in, 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 in Second Timothy. So they are, um, they are, um, they're uh, not good examples in the Christian in the Christian scripture, but but it shows that by that time, they could throw them out in the Christian scripture, and it it was like you didn't have to explain who they were. They're not. It just it just mentions them, and and you know that who they are. So they were that well known by that period, two thousand years ago, that writers could 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 in, could invoke their name, and people would know who they are. So. Again, not in the Hebrew Bible, but by the time the Christian Bible is canonized, oh, they're they're Giannis and Yambre are, are, are mentioned. So we, we saw them a little bit um, a couple weeks ago. So if you weren't here a couple weeks ago, those are Balaam's sons. Uh, these are bad guys. I mean, Balaam is a bad. I mean, the Pharaoh is the one who kills him, but you got to be a pretty dark lord to dark wizard to uh, tell people to kill babies and bathe in them. So. This is, this is a bad story, a very bad story. So let's read, let's read how, Pharaoh, how Pharaoh is doing with his, um, with his malady. While he was in this agony, the report was brought to him that the children of Israel in Goshen were careless and idle in their forced labor. 
the news aggravated his suffering. And he said, now that I am ill, they turn and scoff at me, harness my chariot, and I will betake myself to Goshen and see the derision with which the children of Israel deride me. And they took and put him upon a horse, for he was not able to mount it himself. When he and his men had come to the border between Egypt and Goshen, the king's steed passed into a narrow place. The other horses running rapidly through the pass pressed upon each other until the king's horse fell while he sat upon it. And when it fell, the chariot turned over on his face and also the horse lay upon him. The king's flesh was torn from him for this thing was from the Lord. He had heard the cries of his people and their affliction. The king's servants carried him upon their shoulders, brought him back to Egypt, and placed him on his bed. Yeah, so Pharaoh not only not only is suffering the skin disease, but he is uh, in an accident. And the accident leaves him even more disfigured because the face um his face is i mean it's like horrible i mean this is like it was bad and now it got even worse it was bad it got worse and now it's really really horror horrific so he's being punished now again it's begs the question you know why did you know did god do anything so this is god did this um again What's the impetus for this? That he hears that the Israelites are they're lollygagging, they're lollygagging as uh, he's sick. So they want it, you know, he, he's upset by their by their um, they're not working hard. So now we're going to read what happens as he's dying. So this is kind of the longer midrash of the that first Pharaoh dying before the one, this is not the one that, this is the one that Moses ran away from, not the one that he's going to confront. He knew that his end was come to die and the queen Al-Faramit and his nobles gathered upon his bed and they wept a great weeping with him. The princes and his counselors advised the king to make a choice of a successor to reign in his stead, whomsoever he would choose from among his sons. He had three sons and two daughters by the queen Al-Faranit, besides children from concubines. The name of his firstborn was Atro, the name of the second Adikam, and of the third Morion. The name of the older daughter was Bithia, and of the other Akuzi. The firstborn of the sons of the king was an idiot, precipitate and heedless in all his actions. Adikam, the second son, was a cunning and clever man and versed in all the wisdom of Egypt, but ungainly in appearance, fleshy and short of stature. His height was a cubit and a space, and his beard flowed down to his ankles. He sounds like a, a very strange looking guy. This second oldest prince. Um, and again, it mentions that Pharaoh's kids include Bithia, who is Moses's foster mother. So this is the Pharaoh's family. Now, where do they get this from? We don't know. Um, is it an ancient legend about, you know, Pharaoh's, uh, a Pharaoh's family, perhaps? Was it about Greco-Roman rulers that they had more recently come in contact, a possibility. We don't really know, but these kind of things happen a lot where, you know, there might have been a older king who looked more of the part, the younger king didn't look the part, but was more competent, but, uh, or at least clever. Uh, so, these are not uncommon stories in, in monarchies and in families. Uh, this 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 uh, jockeying for position is really wild to see it happen. And 
especially where there's multiple wives, which this text says that there were other wives, right? There were concubines that he had kids with. So we know it happened in the Bible. We see it happening with David, with King David's sons, how Solomon was a dark horse candidate, never should have been king. All the other sons basically either get killed or are disqualified. So it, it's, it's, uh, it was a weird thing in the ancient world, and it's a weird thing today. Nowadays, it usually doesn't have as much effect on the world, but if you live in, if you live in I'll put it out there, Saudi Arabia, for example, it's, it's weird. It's weird trying to figure out who's going to be the next king and how many you know, people are going to support the, the new guy. And it, it's, a, it's a weird thing. And, and that is billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars at stake. And, and it, it does affect our world too. So uh, these issues are, are in the Midrash, but they, they are par for the course in, in monarchies. So what is this guy going to do? The king resolved that Adikam should reign in his stead after his death. When this second son of his was but 10 years old, he had given him Gedida, the daughter of Abila, to wife, and she bore him four sons. Afterward, Adikam went and took three other wives and begot eight sons and three daughters. It's pretty descriptive. I mean, it's pretty, pretty detailed stuff here. But we don't have any record of these kings. The king's malady increased upon him greatly, and his flesh emitted a stench like a carcass cast into the field in summertime in the heat of the sun. When he saw that his disorder had seized upon him with a strong grip, he commanded his son Adikam to be brought to him, and they made him king over the land in his place. Yep. At the at the end of three years, the old king died in shame and disgrace, a loathing to all that saw him, and they buried him in the sepulcher of the kings of Egypt in Zoan, but they did not embalm him as was usual with kings, for his flesh was putrid, and they could not approach his body on account of the stench, and they buried him in haste. Thus, the Lord requited him with evil for the evil he had done in his days to Israel, and he died in terror and shame after having reigned 94 years. Yeah, the problem is he reigns for a really, really long time. So if he was a really bad king uh, and has a really bad punishment, it's not, it's not because he didn't reign for a long time. He reigns for a long time and does really bad things to the Jewish people, which he's punished by. So how do we come up with these, these, this long reign? Well, you kind of have to have it because if this was the Pharaoh that took over after Joseph died, that means that he reigns from basically the time of, of, uh, of after Joseph just to the time that right before Moses is going to come back. So it's kind of tough to get to those years without somebody reigning a really, really long time, which that guy reigns a long time. Uh, his, his son is also pretty young when he takes over. But again, the rabbis did something very interesting here, which is that they, they punished a pharaoh with like the worst punishment you could have if you're an Egyptian king, right? If you don't get embalmed, if you don't get put into the process of, of mummification you're the you're the ultimate loser you lose out on the world to come in egyptian mythology you know you don't get to come back with all your wealth and with all your treasures body you know your gifts and stuff like that you don't get it so yeah his body going this way is like the ultimate punishment for an egyptian it's not good for anybody. Don't get me wrong. Nobody wants to. Nobody wants to uh, be buried and smell so bad that nobody can come near him. But uh, for the Egyptians, it was really, really bad. So let's look what happens to the new king. 
Adi Khan was 20 years old when he succeeded his father, and he reigned four years. The people of Egypt called him Pharaoh, as was their custom with all their kings. But his wise men called him Akuz, for Akuz is the word for short in the Egyptian <laughs> language, and Adi Khan was exceedingly awkward and undersized. The new pharaoh surpassed his father Malol and all the former kings in wickedness, and he made heavier the yoke upon the children of Israel. He went to Goshen with his servants and increased their labor, and he said to them, complete your work every day's task, and let not your hands slacken from the work from this day forward, as you did in the day of my father. He placed officers over them from among the children of Israel, and over these officers, he placed taskmasters from amongst his servants. And he put the, before them a measure of four bricks according to the number they were to make day by day. And whenever any deficiency was discovered in the measure of their daily bricks, the taskmasters of Pharaoh would go to the women of the children of Israel and take their infants from them, as many as the number of bricks lacking in the measure and these babes they put into the building instead of the missing bricks. The taskmasters forced each man of the Israelites to put his own child in the building. The father would place his son in the wall and cover him over with mortar, all the while weeping, his tears running down upon his child. So if you thought that the bathing, if you thought the bathing in the blood was bad, this is horrific. I mean, I'm telling you, this is the, uh, like an ultimate nightmare. I don't know what else to say. I mean, I mean, I warned you, I told you that this was going to be graphic and upsetting. Yeah, this isn't just weird. This is really, really horrific. Um, I mean, it's horrific that they used human bodies, according to this, in, in the building. But the fact that people had to use their own kids, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just horrific. So this is like the biggest nightmare you can imagine. So this is, this is what they've done. Um, so that's, that's the... Uh, that's the rabbinic midrash on that they had to make their own bricks, right? So the Torah tells us that, you know, originally they had to build these cities. And then what does he, what does the Pharaoh do? The Pharaoh says, now you have to bring your own bricks. You have to get your own bricks. And so what's the point here? If you didn't get your bricks, if you didn't make your bricks, your kids were your bricks. So... This is part of the Midrash that's been there for thousands of years. I mean, this isn't like a new nightmare. This isn't somebody writing, you know, post, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre type stuff. This is ancient imagination too, that this horrific kind of stuff that happened. So this is really, really bad. I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything other than this is a nightmare, this is an ultimate nightmare. So uh, this is the Midrash and what it meant to make the bricks. Here we go. The children of Israel sighed every day on account of their dire suffering, for they had thought that after Pharaoh's death, his son would lighten their toil. But the new king was worse than his father. And God saw the burden of the children of Israel and their heavy work and he determined to deliver them. However, it was not for their own sake that God resolved upon the deliverance of the children of Israel, for they were empty of good deeds, and the Lord foreknew that once they were redeemed, they would rise up against him and even worship the golden calf. Yet he took mercy upon them, for he remembered his covenant with the fathers and he looked upon their repentance for their sins and accepted their promise to fulfill the word of God after their going forth from Egypt, even before they should hear it. 
After all, the children of Israel were not wholly without merits. In a high degree, they possessed qualities of extraordinary excellence. There were no incestuous relations among them. They were not evil-tongued. They did not change their names. They clung to the Hebrew language, never giving it up, and great fraternal affection prevailed among them. If one happened to finish the tale of his bricks before his neighbors, he was in the habit of helping the others. Therefore, God spoke, they deserve that I should have mercy upon them. For if a man shows mercy unto one another, I have mercy upon him. Okay. So this last part of the Midrash deals with uh, how God finally responded to us. Um, we don't have a lot of, of words about what happened to us during this period. As we, ta- as we showed, the discussion of Moses and Sipporah uh, takes up more of chapter two than almost anything else. And then in chapter three, we read the burning bush, which we're, gonna, we're about to get to right now. So we don't really know what what happened to finally get God to say, I got to do something now. Again, to some extent, it's preordained. So like the Torah itself says in Genesis that we are going to be slaves in Egypt. So it's it's part of destiny, if you will, in, in the mind of the rabbis, because it is in the Torah. But there's this other idea that, again, you know, it was a test, almost a crucible, um, which you get from a lot of experiences of Jewish tragedy, including, as we mentioned, the similarities between the Holocaust and the experience in Egypt have not gone unnoticed by uh, rabbis, really of all movements. You know, it's not just the Orthodox who go, it's, it was another version of, of, of Egyptian bondage. Uh, these horrific things that we read about, pretty much every nightmare you can imagine happened during the Holocaust. I mean, they'll say that, but even, even non-Orthodox kind of understandings of the Holocaust are that we were we the egypt egypt was a lot of ways like a predecessor to it and this concept of israel becoming a nation becoming a people in egypt is an interesting idea because it means that we really became a people in the diaspora and that we experienced such horrific things that the people who emerged out of that hell nothing was going to break them ever and so the rabbis went in another direction too here, which is, but what kind of people were they? You know, and it's easy to imagine that their lives were horrible and that they weren't very good people either. Which again, kind of, you know, every time I read this in the Torah or in the Midrash, you know, it makes me think about the Holocaust, which is, um, which is what we do. Um, and there was a very famous saying from, from uh, Viktor Frankl, who survived the Holocaust and wrote Man's Search for Meaning and, and uh, wrote about the psychological aspects of, of being a survivor and what we can learn from that. He, he said, after surviving Auschwitz, that it wasn't the best people who survived, it was the worst people that survived. And he was speaking about himself. He was saying the people who survived who could not be crushed by watching everybody around them die, the people who could pick up that extra crumb and and get it before somebody else did, he said, those are the people that survived. And he lamented that fact. I mean, he didn't, he wasn't saying it with pride. He was saying it to some extent with despair and with, and with a sense of, you know, don't think that, you know, we survivors who survived were the, were the kind ones. Um, it's a pretty harsh thing to, to hear. Uh, the Midrash goes the opposite direction, which says that even while they were suffering, the Israelites were helping each other. And by the way, that doesn't mean people didn't help each other in the camps. Of course they did. But there is also this kind of like, like how do you survive? You know, do you, do you be, just become an animal almost trying to survive 
you know, what lengths will you go to? Go to? And so the, the Midrash asks that question thousands of years ago, and they basically say, well, people didn't give up on their humanity, that it's still, that they still did certain things that merited their redemption, which of course then gets us down that hole of, well, do you have to merit redemption? I mean, doesn't God just want to help people who are being punished for no reason, especially people that he said he's going to take care of? I mean, those are the questions that, that are at stake here. And so the rabbis get into some details. They say, look, there were things that we didn't do right, and there's things that we did do right. And I don't want to say they're blaming the victim sometimes, but kind of are sometimes. But what they say here is that, look, the Jews did certain things in Egypt that maintained their humanity. And one of them was they didn't practice incest, which you'd say, well, you know, is that really that big of a deal? Well, remember, they're in a country in Egypt where incest is the norm. The pharaohs, they practice incest so, incest. so why not, you know, they didn't do that. Also says they didn't speak bad about people, which is hard to do anytime. And then this other issue we get to is that they didn't change their names. Well, this is weird because Moses's name is definitely changed. I mean, it says so. But they're saying that basically, while they were living in Egypt, they kept Hebrew names. Now, did they have an Egyptian name and a Hebrew name like we do today? I don't know. But there seems to be this understanding that if you keep a Hebrew name, if you have a Hebrew name, there is still something Jewish about you, which they also then get into the Hebrew language. They still used Hebrew. Now, you, you kind of wonder if the rabbis are not writing this in a Greco-Roman culture that they are dealing with their own, like, what will we not give up? You know, what are the things that we're not going to give up? You know, whether this is really not about them, you know, as opposed to their ancestors. So it's kind of that weird is thing. Like, if, if we wrote the Midrash today, what would we say we wouldn't give up? Yeah, Reverend Lynn. Is there some sense that by not giving up their Hebrew names that God will know them? If, if they change their names, perhaps God won't know them. Yeah, there, there is that, right? There is that kind of mystic idea that, that, that uh, you know, that's there. Look, it seems to be the case. You know, it seems to be based on the biblical account that they did have there, with the exception of Moses. You know, they were keeping Hebrew names. You know, Heved is a Hebrew name. Amram is a Hebrew name. His parents had Hebrew names. Uh, Aaron is... Hebrew name. It's not, well, it's not an Egyptian name. Well, look, it's a Semitic name. So, so when we look at the names, Miriam, Hebrew name, uh, and we had the Midrash, by the way, we read that Moses, we, well, we assume he had a Hebrew name because it says his Egyptian mother gave him that. So the Midrash gave us seven possible names that he was known as, known, known by in Hebrew. So, but I do think it speaks to this idea that keeping a Hebrew name or passing on a Hebrew name to a child is like one of those last things that you do to maintain, to maintain your Judaism. And it is one of those things that kind of like, you're, yeah, there's the mystical idea that God will find you. But there's also this kind of like, like it's like the last, my last connection to the Jewish people is that I have a Hebrew name. There's something powerful about that. And, and regardless of whether God, you know, that's the way God finds us, though, again, there, there's this idea that that's how God knows us. Um, but there's this idea that, like, somehow if we have a Hebrew name, then we're connected to the people. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful. Uh, it's a pretty powerful idea of, uh, and, and, and I think, still relevant um i mean we know as we said we well we, we assume that they're not circumcised because when they go into when they go into the land of israel we talked about this they all had to be circumcised when they came into the land they joshua takes them they all get circumcised make this hill of foreskins and they come into the land in the book of john i mean it's in the bible so 
assumedly they weren't doing a lot of other stuff. They weren't celebrating in the question of like, what did Jews do, by the way, at that time? What did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do? And again, in the rabbi's mind, they had all the rituals already. God had told them what to do. But the assumption here is that after living in Egypt, they didn't know it anymore, but they kept Hebrew. But it really does actually, you know, there is an interesting question buried in there, which was, what mitzvot were they were they supposed to be keeping? I mean, what were they supposed to be doing in the land of Egypt as, as a people? Because remember, they've gone from being a family, they came down as a family, to now being a nation. What was binding these people together? So uh, ritually or, or culturally, or as far as customs or folkways or whatever you want to call them, and what did they do? Because if they if they were now living for a few generations in Egypt, what did they know? I mean, they didn't have a background. It wasn't like they could share the Torah. Well, I guess you could say they could share the Torah, but they didn't, I mean, we don't know what they had. So it is, um, the rabbis kind of reduce it to like basic human behaviors that they shouldn't be having. And they still spoke, spoke a little bit of Hebrew. So an interesting lesson, if you will, for today, I don't know. I, I think there's definitely some relevance there to who we are today. And I think there was in the ancient world. I think when the rabbis wrote this during the Roman, Greco-Roman period, a lot of people who said, you know what, I don't want to speak Hebrew anymore. Everybody out there is speaking Greek. By the way, they weren't speaking Latin in Israel, they were speaking Greek. Because in most of the Roman Empire, at least in the Eastern Roman Empire, they were speaking Greek. That was the like official language of Turkey, you know, the, what would be Turkey today, Syria, Egypt, all those areas spoke Greek back to Alexander the Great time. So you know, the Romans just kept letting people speak Greek and encouraged it and made sure that their officers and generals and governors all spoke Greek if they were getting sent out to uh, the far ends of the Eastern Empire. Um, yeah, they all spoke Greek. So did the rabbis deal with this in their own generation? Yeah, probably. Probably dealt with Jews who were like, I don't want to learn Hebrew anymore. And, I, and by the way, I'll, I'll take a Greek name. And they may have also had a Hebrew name, but it could be that some of these guys were taken taking Greek names. And we know one of the great rabbis of the Bible, of the uh, Talmud, excuse me, one of the great uh, rabbis that we quoted frequently, Eliezer ben Hyrcanus. Well, Eliezer is definitely a Hebrew name. Hyrcanus is not a Hebrew name. That's a Greek name. That's about as Greek as you can get. So his dad had a Greek name. Um, all the Maccabee kings ended up, we were talking about for Hanukkah, they all took a Greek name. They all had a Hebrew name, but they also had a Greek name. Judas, you, Judah, Maccabees descendants, they kept his name Judah, but they called themselves Aristo, Aristobulus, or they called, you know, the, the, the uh, Jonathan guys, you know, became, um, so, I mean, some became, some of them became Alexanders, you know, these guys took on Greek names. So uh, this might have been very relevant for these guys who wrote this. What are we not? What are we not going to give up? So let's turn back to Moses. Let's go back to the burning bush, back to Midian, and we're going to read the midrash on Moses. A faithful shepherd, when he trod bestowed his daughter Zipporah upon Moses as his wife, he said to his future son-in-law, "I know that your father Jacob took his wives." the daughters of Laban and went away with them against their father's will. Now take an oath that you will not do the same with me. And Moses swore not to leave him without his consent. And he remained with Yitro who made him the shepherd of his flocks. By the way he tended the sheep, God saw his fitness to be the shepherd of his people. For God never gives an exalted office to a man until he has tested him in little things. Thus, Moses and David were tried as shepherds of flocks, and only after they had proved their ability as such, he gave them dominion over men. Yeah, so you have to, you have to intern, right? You have to do your internship if you wanna be working for God. 
he gives you little things. God gives you little things to do before you get the big responsibilities. Uh, but this midrash is also wonderful because it puts into um, Yitro's mouth. You better not leave the way Jacob left. You know, don't pull one of those ex exits, which we just actually read in the Torah portion uh, a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago. We read, we were in, we read when uh, Jacob, in the end of Vayetze, the beginning he goes, and at the end of the portion he leaves. And when he leaves, uh, Laban's not happy. So, uh, so Jethro says, don't do that to me. And what it seems as though Moses was okay with that. Moses didn't, at least at that moment, think that he had a call. Like maybe he was going to re remain here in Midian for the rest of his life, which is an interesting idea. One that, again, I don't know that it goes against what we've read in other places, but kind of is this idea that Moses wasn't necessarily bound for greatness. Moses would have been okay, maybe, living out his life as a shepherd. Which, by the way, seems to be in some of the movie versions. Which we're gonna, I should take a, excuse me, take a look at today. We're going to do a little multimedia today. You'll see why. Moses watched over the flocks with loving care. He led the young animals to pasture first, that they might have the tender, juicy grass for their food. The somewhat older animals he led forth next and allowed them to graze off the herbs suitable for them. And finally came the vigorous ones that had attained their full growth. And to them he gave the hard grass that was left, which the others could not eat, but which afforded good food for them. Then spoke God, he that understands how to pasture sheep, providing for each what is good for it, he shall pasture my people. So that's another great lesson, right? He, as, a, as a leader, as a leader, he knew how to take care of his flock according to what they needed which is not just that he takes care of everybody the same way, but he actually knows how to take care of children and adults. And, and uh, as we have a pastor on, another, another pastor on the line right now, uh, that's one of the reasons why they're called pastors, because they take care of their flock. And, and, um, Moses demonstrates this by the way he takes care of the sheep. The next uh, midrash is fairly well known. Some people think it's actually in the Bible. Uh, this whole description of of uh, of what happens here, but let's take a look for for those who aren't familiar with this with this scene. Let's take a look at it. Once a kid escaped from the flock, and when Moses followed it. He saw how it stopped at all the water courses, and he said to it, Poor kid, I did not know that you were thirsty and were running after water. You are weary, I think. And he carried it back to the herd on his shoulder. Then said God, You have compassion with a flock belonging to a man of flesh and blood. As you live, you shall pasture Israel, my flock. So that's a, how many people have heard that Midrash before? I've heard it in the Christian Bible. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Very, very prominent. So here's what it says in the Torah. I'm going to read it to you line. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father, Yitro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. That's it. That's one line. That sets up story. Now, all of these versions of the same of this, you know, kind of tell us the same thing, which Moses shows that he's ready to be the, the leader by the way he treats the sheep. And so this midrash, which is this you know great story of like even the one sheep that runs away, he's not going to give up on. Uh, and again, the way the rabbis put it, he cares that much about. A sheep, one of the sheep, he cares he that much for a sheep that's not even his, that's for a man of flesh and blood. I think he'll do okay with the people. So it's a wonderful midrash. And again, it 
follows this tradition that we have. Um, but one can make the argument, just because you're nice to sheep doesn't necessarily mean you're nice to people. It's a fair question, right? So here's what, there's other midrash on this. Not only did Moses take heed that no harm should come to the herds under his charge, but he was also careful that they cause no injury to men. He always chose an open meadow as his pasturing place to prevent his sheep from grazing in private estates. Yeah, so uh, he, didn't, he, he was a good neighbor. It's a good, it's a good neighbor. So, so, uh, but again, look what he look look at the things that he does. Yitro had no reason to be dissatisfied with the services rendered to him by his son-in-law. During the forty years Moses acted as his shepherd, not one sheep was attacked by wild beasts, and the herds multiplied to an incredible degree. Once he drove the sheep about in the desert for forty days without finding a pasturing place for them. Nevertheless, he did not lose a single sheep. Yep, again, all this is you know, 40 days, you know, mm -hmm. a precursor to 40 days. Again, a lot of people think this is all in the Torah. It's not, I read you the, I read you the line. That there's one line about Moses with the sheep before he sees the which we're, we're going to get to. Don't worry, you can see. Just a couple paragraphs. Moses' longing for the desert was irresistible. His prophetic spirit caused him to foresee that his own greatness and the greatness of Israel would manifest themselves there. In the desert, God's wonders would appear, though it would be at the same time the grave of the human herd to be entrusted to him in the future and also his own last resting place. Thus, he had a presentiment at the very beginning of his career that the desert would be the scene of his activity, which not only came true in the present order of things, but also will be true in the latter days when he will appear in the desert again to lead into the promised land, the generation arisen from their graves that he brought forth from Egyptian bondage. Okay, so let's, let's Let's, let's dissect that a little bit. So Moses, Moses liked the desert. This experience, he, he liked it. Now, again, this assumes that before this, before this time, he wasn't in the desert, right? He lived in Egypt. Maybe he was a king, prince, whatever he did. This lifestyle of being out in the desert, he really liked. Um, I myself, not a big fan. Some of you, I mean, Rosemary, you lived in Acton. I mean, that's that's about yeah, as- Yes, I lived in Acton and in Palm Springs. So I'm pretty familiar with desert. Yeah, so some people dig this a lot. Some people love the desert. And the rabbis imagine that Moses actually likes it, which is, which is interesting because, I, I mean, I guess it kind of, it's good because he's gonna spend a lot of time there as they say. But it's also not necessarily what you would have expected from somebody who was or should have been in another situation, would have been a, a leader or a king or a prophet or a guy that wouldn't have had to have such a rough climate to do his work in. But he, this is his place. This is, and so the rabbis teach that he knew this. God gave him the prophetic understanding that this was where he's going to do his work. Which again, you know, kind of begs the question, do people find a calling or find a reason to be in the place that they're in? You know, are they in the place that God tells them to be in? Um, the rabbis assume that, yes, Moses wouldn't have been there unless he felt the calling to be there. So, um, so this is where he's going to work for the next 40 years. It's where he's going to die because he isn't given a burial, you know, in a nice burial, you know, burial spot. We don't know where he's buried. He's buried out somewhere in the desert in, 
in the mountains of, of Mount Nebo, you know, somewhere out in Jordan, Moab. So, um, kind of a weird setup for this, but maybe nothing's as weird as this last line, which is that Moses is going back to the desert when the Messiah comes and when everybody's reborn, resurrected, he has to go out to the desert to finish the job he started, bringing those people to the promised land. So this is a wild midrash. I mean, I mean, the whole thing is, you know, kind of understanding Moses and why he is in the desert and why he's in the desert before he goes to Egypt and brings them back into the desert. But this idea that Moses is going to finally finish the job for those people who had to die in the wilderness is really, really powerful. Thousands of years later, he's finally going to bring those people home. They're not home. They're, they're buried out in the wilderness, which is not where they're supposed to be, whereas he's not supposed to be. So it's a really wild idea that it's not it's not just a, it's not just a, like, well, he was, you know, he's in the desert. No, he's, 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 he's going to come home and he's going to bring all those people. Home. So interesting idea, interesting idea. All right. Now we're going to get to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, or again, what is this mountain? Is this the same mountain we're going to get the Ten Commandments on? Because this mountain seems like a pretty, must have been a pretty important mountain if he sees the burning bush here and, and he comes back to this place with the people. Now, um, let's explain. Here's the last paragraph. Wandering through the desert, he reached Mount Hora which is called by six names, each conveying one of its distinctions. It is the mountain of God, wherein the Lord revealed his law, Bashan, for God came there, a mountain of humps, for the Lord declared all the other mountains unfit for the revelation. As crook-backed, animals are declared unfit for sacrifices, mountain of abode, because it is the mountain that God desired for his abode, Sinai, because the hatred of God against the heathen began at the time when Israel received the law thereon, and Horeb, sword, because there the sword of the law was drawn upon the sinners. Uh huh. So those are names that, well, some of them aren't really names, they're descriptions. Mountain of the Lord, Mountain of God. Um, that's more of a description than a than a name, but the rabbis point out that it's called different names in the Bible. Some of them were not, and we're talking about Genesis through all the way through Psalms, etc. But the problem is in Exodus itself, it's called Mount Horeb, which the rabbis here say is connected to the, the word harab, which means sword. It's the same word in Arabic, by the way, harab. And the sword because it's like sticks out like a, you know you'd think it was because it sticks up you know like a like a sword in the ground no it's because the sword of the law is against the sinners uh but in here in 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 exodus in chapter three it says that moses oh, actually i'll show you moses is sometimes the names are given together sometimes they're combined so you you've got You've got a um, you've got an interesting thing that sometimes the names are given together. So here it says Moses. This is the one line I'm telling you. And they came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now in other places, it's called Horeb and Sinai are used by either different authors or they're used interchangeably. But the rabbis have a problem in that it's called two different names. Is it two different mountains? No. Well, they're not going to accept that it's two different mountains. 
Uh, Horeb becomes another name for this mountain. Um, we don't know exactly where this mountain is. According to tradition, there's a monastery um, on this mountain, or a mountain that's called Mount Sinai and now the Egyptian desert. But we don't know for sure. What's interesting is, is that one of the reasons why Israel was okay with giving that land back to Egypt after Camp David was because it's clearly not in the land of Israel. There is no pretense that it is. It's not. It's in the wilderness. And so that we know for sure. It's in the wilderness, and it's a mountain, and it's a mountain of God, which, again, teaches us that not every holy place is in the land of Israel. I mean, I think that should tell us that. But again, the idea that he comes back to that spot, you know, that's a wonderful thing, too, that Moses comes back to the spot of his, his revelation to give the people his revelation. So let's take a look at the burning bush. And we are going to, yeah, we're going we're gonna to read here the burning bush. When Moses drew near to Mount Horeb, he was aware at once that it was a holy place, for he noticed that passing birds did not alight upon it. At his approach, the mountain began to move as though to go forward and meet him, and it settled back into quietude only when his foot rested upon it. The first thing Moses noticed was the wonderful burning bush, the upper part of which was a blazing flame neither consuming the bush nor preventing it from bearing blossoms as it burnt, for the celestial fire has three peculiar qualities. It produces blossoms, it does not consume the object around which it plays, and it is black of color. The fire that Moses saw in the bush was the appearance of the angel Michael, who had descended as the forerunner of the Shekinah herself to come down presently. It was the wish of God to hold converse with Moses, who, however, was not inclined to permit any interruption of the work under his charge. Therefore, God startled him with the wonderful phenomenon of the burning thorn bush. That brought Moses to a stop, and then God spoke with him. So what actually happens in that burning bush? An angel? maybe, but it's the precursor of the real connection he's going to have to God, which is the Shekhinah, which again then begs the question, what did God's voice sound like? The burning bush. What did God sound like? Because at least right here we have that Michael's there and the Shekhinah, and as you can see, the Shekhinah herself. Interesting, folks. May not have known that. And that's a real old Midrash, folks. But God spoke to Moses, maybe not the kind of voice that you'd think. Well, let's get, we'll get, we'll come we back. Heard, yeah. Have, have we heard before the Shekinah referred to as female? It always has to be. That, 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 that yeah, we, we had it a couple weeks ago with, um, not with the angel that, not with uh oh that was two wednesday sorry with the angels we were reading with uh we were reading the torah portion of jacob wrestling the angel obviously that's not the shaking that's a definitely a male angel um we read about the shekhinah a few weeks ago somebody helped me out where was the context for the shekhinah then i don't remember the surrounding but, I, but I, I don't remember it being so explicitly female. You, well, yeah, usually, usually they just refer to the Shekhinah here. They use the pronoun. But the important thing, Reverend, is every time you see the word Shekhinah, we know, we're, we know what that final hey at the end, we know we're talking about a feminine presence. So the interesting thing here, though, is that at least the rabbis threw out there that so, so what you just read I mean, you'll see versions of this right now in the other midrash, but the other these other midrash that the, that the burning bush may have been Michael, 
an angel. But the words, the 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 word that he hears is the Shekinah speaking to him. Because he doesn't hear God directly, assumedly. He's he's hearing the Shekinah. I promise we'll get to that. And I actually want to play you something. Maybe what somebody thinks God sounds like. All right. Uh, but let's get back to the to the bush itself. Why a bush? There were good reasons for selecting the thorn bush as the vessel for a divine vision. It was clean, for the heathen could not use it to make idols. God's choosing to dwell in the stunted thorn bush conveyed the knowledge to Moses that he suffers along with Israel. Furthermore, Moses was taught that there is nothing in nature, not even the insignificant thorn bush that can exist without the presence of the Shekhinah. Besides, the thorn bush may be taken as the symbol for Israel in several respects. As the thorn bush is the lowliest of all species of trees, so the condition of Israel in the exile is the lowliest as compared with that of all the other nations. But as the thorn bush releases no bird that alights upon it without lacerating its wings, so the nations that subjugate Israel will be punished. Also, as a garden hedge is made of the thorn bush, so Israel forms the hedge for the world, the garden of God, for without Israel, the world could not endure. Furthermore, as the thorn bush bears thorns and roses alike, so Israel has pious and impious members. And as the thorn bush require ample water for its growth, so Israel can prosper only through the Torah, the celestial water. And the thorn bush, the leaf of which consists of five leaflets, was to indicate to Moses that God had resolved to redeem Israel only for the sake of the merits of five pious men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Aaron, and Moses. The numbers represented by the letters composing the Hebrew word for thorn bush, sene, add up to 120 to convey that Moses would reach the age of 120 years and that the Shekhinah would rest on Mount Horeb for 120 days. Finally, in order to give Moses an illustration of his modesty, God descended from the exalted heavens and spoke to him from a lowly thorn bush instead of the summit of a lofty mountain or the top of a stately cedar tree. So you had a little lesson in horticulture. No, it's a, it's a really wonderful set of, there's, there's a few different midrashim that are woven together here about the bush itself. So um, some of it, again, is explaining why God would come to a thorn bush, which is, you know, this theme of, because God is everywhere. And don't think that God wouldn't be in, um, you know, you might be looking for God in the cedar tree, the big lofty, you know, amazing tree like the ones out in, in uh, Sequoia, right? God's in, in the bush, in the, in, in the, in the, you know, in the, on the hillside, right? So it's really interesting, this idea that is conveyed by, again, the tree, the, 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 the bush. But there are other reasons too, and you've read some of them that, you know, these are not trees that people used for idolatry. So nobody would be worshiping it and saying, oh, that's what, of course, God appears in the in the cedar tree. That's where all the gods appear, you know. Nope. Um, but then, then it is compared. It, what is the statement? The, the statement of of the of the bush is is us. The God appearing to us in the way that in the representation of who we are, which is on one hand very weak, weak people in exile, which of course was the case when we were in Egypt, but the rabbis knew when they were writing this that we were in exile. So they're, of course, talking about themselves, uh, talking about us, but not to give up hope, right? Because anybody who comes against us, 
will be like that bird that tries to come into a, a, a thorn bush. You're not going to get away without a couple scratches. Uh, and again, this idea that we're, the, we're here as Jews to protect the world. Well, that's a pretty, pretty wonderful responsibility. That's a huge responsibility for us. But that we have this reality that we're there to protect the world from going off the rails. Before you get too full of yourself, just remember what else the Midrash said. Just like there's thorns and roses in the bush, there's some thorny Jews out there and, and they're not all good. So yeah, there's some good there's some good people here, but there's also a lot of thorns too. So don't think that it's all we're all good. But then again, what else, of course, is that like every tree, though, you can make the argument every tree needs uh, needs to have water. And our water is the Torah. Mayim Khan, the living waters of Torah. So some really great, and some of them are like a little bit more unique, this understanding of the Hebrew word sna, which is the word that's used in the Torah for um, bush. If you add up the three letters of sna, it comes out to 120, which is how long Moses lives for. And of course, how long, so Samech Nun He, uh, comes out to um, comes out to 120 if you add up those uh, if you add up those letters. Um, it's funny because we have a friend in Israel, and his some of you met him on our trips to Israel. Um, his name is Ephraim Sneh, uh, which he was a uh, he's a retired brigadier general. He's a part of the uh, Israel has a cop party. He was a part of the Labor Party for many, many years. For most of his life, he was in the Knesset as a Labor Party. And he was a minister of health because he was a, he was a doctor. So some of us, I don't remember which trip. It was, I think, the first trip he came out and met us uh, when we were in Jerusalem, Ephraim Sneh. And what was interesting was his father, his father, um, Moshe Sneh, was a Haganah commander in the Haganah. And was one of the founders of the uh, Israeli Labor Party, but the, like the far left of the Labor Party at the time. Uh, he actually later became a member of, of Maki, which was the Israeli Communist Party. But Ephraim Sne, uh, Moshe Sne, his father, his 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 Yiddish name or his Jewish name was was Kleinboim, which means little tree. So when they became Israeli, when they moved to Israel, when his, his father was born in Poland, Moshe Sneh was born in Poland, when he made Aliyah, he, they took on Hebrew names. And so what did he want to be called? He called himself a bush. But of course, it's not, everybody knows that the word Sneh in Hebrew conveys the bush, the burning bush. So it was a name that was, was very meaningful. But it does remind us that, uh, again, the word sne, um, it was not a name probably anybody would have taken. Um, you know, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have necessarily taken uh, in in uh, well, not in the ancient world. Sne is kind of like a, a dumpy thorn, a dumpy little tree, but they took that name, and of course, by the Jews, the Torah turns it into. A very special plant, which is the plant that God will appear in to us. So again, a lot of great lessons about the the thorn, the thorn bush. It's, it's kind of like I don't want to say anything. You know, I don't know if it's exact. I don't know how many people can you know consider the lily. You know, that's the that's for Reverend Lynn. Consider the lily. Um, you know the the using nature to kind of teach a lesson is, is a great thing to do as well. But uh, um, this is the example of like the lowest form of tree. The rabbis couldn't let that, couldn't let that go. So let's, uh, that's the bush. Let's get to, let's get to Moses, what he saw, what he heard. Here we go. 
The Ascension of Moses. The vision of the burning bush appeared to Moses alone. The other shepherds with him saw nothing of it. He took five steps in the direction of the bush to view it at close range. And when God beheld the countenance of Moses, distorted by grief and anxiety over Israel's suffering, he spoke, this one is worthy of the office of pasturing my people. Moses was still a novice in prophecy. Therefore, God said to himself, if I reveal myself to him in loud tones, I shall alarm him. But if I reveal myself with a subdued voice, he will hold prophecy in low esteem. Whereupon he addressed him in his father Amram's voice. Moses was overjoyed to hear his father speak, for it gave him the assurance that he was still alive. The voice called his name twice, and he answered, Here am I. What is my father's wish? God replied, saying, I am not your father. I but desired to refrain from terrifying you. Therefore, I spoke with your father's voice. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. These words rejoiced Moses greatly, for not only was his father Amram's name pronounced in the same breath with the names of the three patriarchs, but it came before theirs, mm -hmm. as though he ranked higher than they. Okay, so let's um, <laughs> let's explain why the Midrash just did that. Well, they have they're working with what's in the Torah, obviously. They're they're gonna use the text that they have. So let's look at what they have. So it says, first of all, we read the first line. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the blazing fire out of the bush. He gazed there and the bush was all aflame, but the bush was not consumed. So that we have. That you know really well. Moses said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? And so we have here the Midrash, the understanding that the other, there, there were other shepherds there, and they didn't see it. So that's a wonderful idea that, again, I see something and other people don't see it. Um, also, again, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. That's what it says in the blazing fire out of the bush. So that could have been the angel Michael. The question of what else is there, Moses when the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside and that God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he replied, Amen. Amen. Key word in the Bible. Here I am. I'm ready. Here I am. Amen. And again, it says, he said, do not come close. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place which you stand is holy ground. He said, I am, he said, the God of your father. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. And Moses stood his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So here it does say, I am the God of your father. And then the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now look, it looks like from the Torah's take on this, Moses really didn't have much experience with God yet. And the rabbis say he's, he's not, really, not really a prophet. But how much did he know or not know about God? How much did any Jew at the time, any Israelite, not know or not know about God? Um, these are all questions that, again, the rabbis kind of like open up. I will not say they necessarily answer it, but they do give us this idea that Moses has, um, Moses, what he hears of the burning bush from the beginning is um, powerful, not just because of what he's told, but because of what he hears and goes all the way to the voice, which is in the Midrash. And I want to show you something that I said we're going to do a little multimedia. We're going to watch five minutes of this. And then I want to show you why the Midrash is so important for our understanding of these types of things. So... Bear with me as we start this little scene from Prince of Egypt.
We're frozen. Yeah, the rabbi's frozen. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, rabbi I think the frozen. rabbi's frozen. I yeah, texted right. him. <laughs> That's another movie. <laughs> <laughs> Should put a blanket around him. That's a great, great title. Let's work on that. The rabbi is frozen. Sounds like a great detective. Story. <laughs> uh oh, he's gone now. Diane, you're the host. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for all yeah. of you rabbis. Is there any possibility that in the text, that in the, in the Torah, uh, when uh, it says, uh, and he said, I, I am the God of your father, that, that, that's, that we really should read that as I am the God of your father as a name rather than just part of a sentence. Judith, you're the one who knows Hebrew. Oh, I have to look it up. <laughs> give, give me a minute. <laughs> are, are you I mean, in, in... Hey, everybody. Ah. <laughs> the, beauty, the beauty of technology. Welcome back. Right, right, right when we got to the good part. So I, you know, I, I yeah. have no idea. Um, Reverend Wynn, why don't you ask your question again? Is there any chance in the... Torah text that, that we were looking at where it says, um, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, blah, blah, blah. Oh, um, you is there wait. any chance that it says I am as opposed to I am the God of your father? I am the God of your, as, as a name rather than and just- I am sentence? is the name. Yeah, so, 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 so the, the possibility is, is that's what the name God means. That the yud hey vav -Hey word that we don't say is a is it, it seems as though the Hebrew root of that word is being. I am the the word for, the word for present or for the the word for um, existence uh, is this word hovet, which it seems is the is the root for the name for God. That God's name means I am or I will be right. or what. Because he said but that's not punctuated well. What? It shouldn't be I am, comma. I mean I know the Torah doesn't have punctuation, but my text does. And it doesn't it doesn't seem to say that. Your uh, I know I'm being picky, but no, your no, no. text has a comma after I am uh, uh, no, it, it does it uh, it does not, and it seems to me it would change tremendously if it said I am comma the God of your father, but it doesn't say that. But could it mean that anyway? Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me get that up. Am I making you all crazy? No, no, no. I'm getting. I'm, I'm get, I'll get it back up on the. Uh, I'll get it back. Does anyone else hear that? See that? <laughs> Yeah. So, so <laughs> the, uh, hold it one second. I, I don't know if I have. A, I don't. I don't think I have internet. Yeah, I'm like, Your audio is really crappy, yeah. Rabbi. No, yeah, very I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on my phone. I'm on my phone right now. Ah. So as soon as I can get off my phone, I will um, not be on my phone. Um, one second, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Uh, do that right now. Um, yeah, so right now I just logged back in on my phone. I'm going to look at the Torah as soon as I can get my uh, computer restarted in just a moment. I, um, yeah, I think, I think that that's a legitimate, that could be a legitimate uh, 
ocean, just saying, right there I am. But it's definitely in there when God, when he says, when Moses says, what shall I call you? And he says, I am that I am. And yeah, I should right. I yeah. Which, which clearly in that, in that phrase, which is coming up, is clearly God saying, okay. I am what I am. So I, I am, or sometimes again, it's I am or I will be what I will be. Um, because I will be is actually probably a better translation of it. But um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, a, um, it's a very interesting idea that he conveys, that, that, that mo- that's conveyed to Moses here and conveyed to us. What is God? So um, anyways, what I wanted to show everybody in that video is that Moses, at least in, in, in Prince of Egypt, they were very careful to kind of follow the Torah, but even, maybe even more so the Midrash, which is that when God first starts talking to Moses, he does so in a very subtle, very uh, comforting voice. And, and the Midrash says it's so that Moses doesn't get scared. On the other hand, it says that God wanted to make sure that Moses would pay attention so the voice has to have both the, the clarity and the kind of the, the feeling of, of authority, but at the same time, shouldn't scare Moses. So it's a really interesting kind of like, how, do we, how does God at first approach Moses? How do you start off this guy with this really important job and this communication, this long-term communication you need with them? How do you establish this relationship? What, how do you... How does God come across? And I think it kind of begs the question, of course, how do we communicate with people? How do we, you know, how do we speak to people? Well, especially when we know what we'd like to see them do, but, or how, you know, we're trying to get the best out of them. We're trying to get them to do something that's really hard. What do we say to them to get them to, um, to do it? Uh, you know, a lot of times we think about how we, talk to our family members but of course it, it's much deeper than that i mean it, it, it's much more frequent than that too i mean it's our partners it's our uh, co-workers you know the people that we speak to how do we establish that that uh authority but at the same time not come across like a jerk you know and i think i think what's interesting about the way the rabbis teach that midrash is that God had to think about that. I mean, God actually, like, it has an internal conversation about how am I going to speak to Moses? How do I get him to understand how important what he's going to do is? But at the same time, how is um, how how do I not scare him? How do I not freak him out? Which, of course, is what, as we know, or you may remember, that's exactly what happens to Moses at this scene which is he gets freaked out. He doesn't like the idea of um, being called to this mission and he doesn't feel worthy of doing it. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the Midrash that we're given. And again, I think it calls into question, how do, how do we, how do we communicate to people? What do we do to, to, especially when we really need something, how do we communicate it to people? So, I found that I found that to be an interesting midrash of what did God's voice sound like. Now I do know that when um, when um, the Prince of Egypt, when the writers of the of the and the producers were working on this, they were really conscious of how they were going to communicate uh, and how to uh, deliver God's voice. They were very careful. They wanted to be they wanted to be. Um, respectful of tradition but at the same time they wanted to go in a little different way they didn't want god to sound like james Earl jones they didn't want god to to just be a male voice so in some parts or george of, burns or, or george burns would have been or morgan freeman well yeah that would be our you're right that's our modern you're right what am i talking about it's morgan freeman um but they didn't want the, the, the producers intentionally didn't want God to be that. They didn't want God to come across that. So that was an interesting thing that, they, um, that you'll see in that, in that movie is that God will oftentimes speak as a, uh, as a combination voice, as a composite, what we call it, composite voice 
which has lots of sounds behind it. That I, was interesting. I thought it was also Val Kilmer's voice in the movie. That that God was that God was also Val Kilmer. Yes. So part of what they did is they threw back Val Kilmer's voice on Val Kilmer, right? So that Moses, God hears Moses' voice as his own voice. Um, but what we also heard in the part that we did hear was that Moses hears flashbacks. He hears flashbacks of, of um, he hears flashbacks of what he had heard before, and in some cases, as we saw, things that he didn't hear. Um, you, hear you hear voices that have been going on while they've been slaves. So this is... Um, but these are these are the other these are the other sounds that God has. I'm going back on computer. I restarted, so I'll be right back. Oh, he's gone. We can start talking about him. All right, so we're <laughs> back on. Um, I don't Probably like when I don't like when that happens. Was... I do not like when uh, when techno when our technology is not working properly. So I apologize for that because I, I had the really same thing that. happened earlier. It must be the wind. I was very excited to be able to show a little bit of, of uh, one of my favorite versions of that uh, scene because you almost have to go to animation in order to effectively, I think, convey this type of, of, of moment. So let me just go, I'm gonna show a little, try, I'm gonna try a little bit more. I'm gonna try it one more time. Um, I'm gonna try to, to uh, get this done. That's Mo. Not, that's Val not Kilmer. Anything. That's Val Kilmer. Oh, sorry. Well, one second. I don't know why it wasn't sharing. Okay, so the part that we're hearing right now is Val Kilmer's. I'm going to show it right now. It's Val Kilmer's voice. I shall teach you what to say. And I was their enemy. I was the prince of Egypt, the son of the man who slaughtered. <coughs> <coughs> <coughs>
So that is the way, that's the way the Prince of Egypt shows Moses getting called. And you can see that the way they showed it through, and again, using the Midrash, Moses um, is changed by the experience. He runs back to, we just, I wanted to see how he runs back to Tsipora because he seems to now get it where he didn't have it before. It doesn't seem like he knew what his job was in this world uh, until that moment. So that's what I thought was, you know, again, what they tried to show, but they also began, if you caught it, at the very beginning, he chases the sheep into the cave. So they use that, they use that um, legend of, you know, Moses being the great shepherd and, and, and chasing this one sheep ended up, you know, that, that brought him into the, into Moses, into God's presence. So that's an interesting, again, use of, of how, how the Midrash is so important to the storytelling and to the way that we understand this. So we're going to just finish up with um, this last section before we, we go. Um, and um, Rabbi Mark, he seems yeah. so much younger than you said, or that we discussed before and that. Yeah. Then it's appear that, I don't know, maybe just to me. No, you're right. You're right. Which, which again, it, it's interesting that the way the movie tried to do it, uh, which is the way that most movies do it, they don't want Moses, they don't want to show a, a 70 year old Moses starting off. But if you do the math, and again, we don't know how Moses, how youthful Moses looked. But even if he was using lots of lotions and creams, I mean, he's living in the desert, by the way, too, I should point out. It's dry, it's dry out there. It's not good on the skin. But, um, but in all seriousness, if he really did, if he, if, if he was in the last part of his life when he did this, he shouldn't look, you're right, like a young man. You know, in the, in the, in the Ten Commandments, you know, Charlton Heston ages a lot in that. Uh, he ages a little bit in the Prince of Egypt, but they didn't really go with that understanding of him being older, um, which, again, if you do the math, if he lives to be 120 and he's there in the desert for 40 years, even if they're, even if he's back in Egypt for five or 10 years, 10 years, while the plagues are happening, he's, he's, he's 70 years old. So, um, uh, I want to, we'll read two more paragraphs before we finish up, because I want you to kind of go out on a happy, well, that's, a, that's not a bad note to, to go out and see him, you know, having Moses talk to God. But I want you to see this, uh, what, um, what Moses uh, sees in this, in this, or, you know, experiences in this moment, which again, we read in the Midrash that it's a Shekhinah, that should be maybe a woman's voice. Talking to God, talking uh, as God, sorry, speaking as God to Moses. All right. Moses said not a word. In silent reverence before the divine vision, he covered his face. And when God disclosed the mission with which he charged him of bringing the Israelites forth from the land of Egypt, he answered with humility, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Thereupon spoke God, Moses, you are meek, and I will award you for your modesty. I will deliver the whole land of Egypt into your hand. And besides, I will let you ascend to the throne of my glory and look upon all the angels of the heavens. So Moses gets rewarded for his modesty by being able to not only see the burning bush, but according to this Midrash, and we're going to finish with this, he gets a glimpse of heaven. He gets to see heaven. Not just, you know, the burning bush, but heaven. So here's what he gets to see. Hereupon, God commanded Metatron, the angel of the face, to conduct Moses to the celestial regions amid the sound of music and song, and he commanded him furthermore to summon 30,000 angels to serve as his bodyguard, 15,000 to right of him and 15,000 to left of him. 
In abject terror, Moses asked Metatron, who are you? And the angel replied, I am Enoch, the son of Jared, your ancestor, and God has charged me to accompany you to his throne. But Moses demurred saying, I am but flesh and blood, and I cannot look upon the countenance of an angel. Whereupon Metatron changed Moses's flesh into torches of fire, his eyes into Merkaba wheels, his strength into an angel's, and his tongue into a flame. And he took him to heaven with a retinue of 30,000 angels, one half moving to the right of them and one half to the left of them. Yep. So this is what Moses gets to see in heaven. Angels, lots of angels. And he gets turned into a little bit of an angel himself. And the guy who does this, or the angel who does this, is Metatron, who's none other than Enoch, the guy that God took up before Noah, who walked with God and was taken up. So this is all about the legends, too, of Enoch, who's now up in heaven and is an angel, and the high angel, the angel of the face, the angel who comes closest to God. So Metatron says to Moses, I'm going to show you everything. And Moses says, I can't see it. So the, again, this is a reflection of Moses's again, I can't do this stuff. I can't. Who am I to do this kind of stuff? Metatron says, nah, you'll do it. And so here's what he sees. So he's got these angels all around him too. And here's what he sees in the, in the seven heavens. These are the seven heavens. In the first heaven, Moses saw streams upon streams of water. And he observed that the whole heaven consisted of windows at each of which angels were stationed. Metatron named and pointed out all the windows of heaven to him. The window of prayer and the window of supplication, of weeping and of joy, plenitude and starvation, wealth and poverty, war and peace, conception and birth, showers and soft rains, sin and repentance, life and death, pestilence and healing, sickness and health, and many windows more. Those are the windows that people connect to heaven through. Those are the windows where God's blessings, and I guess you could say curses too, some of them, come down on us. So these are the, this is the, this is the lowest level. This is where, if we're, if we're lucky, our prayers get up to there. Here we go, second heaven. In the second heaven, Moses saw the angel Nuriel standing 300 parasangs high with his retinue of 50 myriads of angels, all fashioned out of water and fire and all keeping their faces turned toward the Shekinah while they sang a song of praise to God. Metatron explained to Moses that these were the angels set over the clouds, the winds and the rains who returned speedily as soon as they have executed the will of their creator to their station in the second of the heavens, there to proclaim the praise of God. So that's what's in the second heaven. We've read this versions of this before when we looked at heaven in the Midrash. We actually did a few weeks of looking at heaven, but uh, this may sound familiar. That's why I said it. But again, it's nice for, to- For yeah. the rabbis, is this metaphor? No, they believed that literally this is the, there were people okay. who did the geography of heaven. This is our geography of right. heaven. Okay. Which you, you have similar verses. I don't, yeah. I, mean, I don't know how similar some of these things are, but these are, these are probably, again, because they interacted with Greeks and Romans and people who like to do geographies of heaven. Right. Yeah. In the third heaven... Moses saw an angel so tall it would take a human being 500 years to climb to his height. He had 70,000 heads, each head having as many mouths, each mouth as many tongues, and each tongue as many sayings. And he, together with his suite of 70,000 myriads of angels made of white fire, praised and extolled the Lord. These, said Metatron to Moses, are called Aralim, and they are appointed over the grass, the trees, the fruits, and the grain. But as soon as they have done the will of their creator, they return to the place assigned to them 
and praise God. So these are angels that go into the world that are everywhere, including in every blade of grass, every grain as an angel. In the fourth heaven, Moses saw a temple, the pillars thereof made of red fire, the staves of green fire, the thresholds of white fire, the boards and clasps of flaming fire, the gates of carbuncles and the pinnacles of rubies. Angels were entering the table, temple and giving praise to God there. In response to a question from Moses, Metatron told him that they presided over the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the other celestial bodies, and all of them intoned songs before God. In this heaven, Moses noticed also the two great planets, Venus and Mars, each as large as the whole earth. And concerning these, he asked to what purpose they had been created. Metatron explained thereupon that Venus lies upon the sun to cool him off in summer, else he would scorch the earth. And Mars lies upon the moon to impart warmth to her, lest she freeze the earth. It's interesting, by the way, again, I don't take this as, you know, ancient astronomy, but it is interesting, this idea that these planets are as big as our Earth, which they're not far wrong. I mean, Venus is very close in size to Mars isn't, but Venus is. So it's interesting that somehow people knew this. I mean, somebody knew it, somebody said it. I, I only want to tell you, again, it's not that these planets have those purposes, but this is the celestial realm, and there is the Moses is getting a peek, peek behind the curtain. He's learning what's happening in the in the motions, right? And so, as he goes deeper and deeper, he's seeing more and more of like what's really what's really behind, and what what he's finding is there's stuff behind that. Here's the fifth heaven. Arrived in the fifth heaven, Moses saw hosts of angels whose nether parts were of snow and their upper parts of fire, and yet the snow did not melt, nor was the fire extinguished, for God had established perfect harmony between the two elements. These angels, called Ashim, have had nothing to do since the day of their creation, but praise and extol the Lord. It seems to me like they can't really figure out what they do, but they did something the first day, and then ever since they're there to praise God. All right. In the sixth of the heavens were millions and myriads of angels praising God. They were called Irene and Kadashim, watchers and holy ones, and their chief was made of hail, and he was so tall, it would take 500 years to walk a distance equal to his height. Okay, so again, these are angels that are like so powerful and so big, again, that they're literally, that's all there is in these, in these heavens. Here's the last. In the last heaven, Moses saw two angels, each 500 parasangs in height, forged out of chains of black fire and red fire. The angels Af, anger, and Hema, wrath, whom God created at the beginning of the world to execute his will. Moses was disquieted when he looked upon them, but Metatron embraced him and said, Moses, Moses, you favorite of God, fear not and be not terrified and Moses became calm. There was another angel in the seventh heaven, different in appearance from all the others, and of frightful mien. His height was so great, it would have taken 500 years to cover an inst a distance equal to it. And from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet, he was studded with glaring eyes, at the sight of which the beholder fell prostrate in awe. This one, said Metatron, addressing Moses, is Samael who takes away the soul from man. Where does he go now, asked Moses, and Metatron replied, to fetch the soul of Job, the pious. Thereupon, Moses prayed to God in these words, O oh, may it be your will, my God, and the God of my fathers, not to let me fall into the hands of this angel. Which is strange, because what's in the last heaven? The angel, angel of, death. of death. Samael who later on is synonymous with the devil, with Satan. But here, he's clearly the angel of, in the highest heaven. And he's not Lucifer. He's not, not necessarily that. 
at all, actually. He's just very powerful, and he's just not somebody you want to ever have to see. He's the last angel you see on earth, if you will. But here we have here we have what he sees in the, in, in the highest heaven. Here in the highest heaven, he saw also the seraphim with their six wings. With two, they cover their face, that they gaze not upon the Shekhinah. And with two, their feet, which being like a calf's feet, they hide to keep secret Israel's transgression of the golden calf. With the third pair of wings, they fly and do the service of the Lord, all the while exclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The wings of these angels are a prodigious size. It would take a man 500 years to traverse their length and their breadth as from one end of the earth to the other. Yeah, kadosh, 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 and right? well, this is the vision that Isaiah sees of these seraphim, of these angels, which by the way, it says they have, they have cow's hooves at, on their, at their end because again, they're composite animals. We haven't read about the golden calf yet, and Moses doesn't know about the golden calf, but it's almost, again, like the reason that they cover their, their feet is so that Israel doesn't remember the golden calf incident and make them feel stupid. So there's angels, the angels cover their, their, their feet with their wings for that reason, but they have six, they have six wings. So it's only, you know, it's only one set of their wings. All right. So these are the these are the obviously the highest angels, the Chayot and the Seraphim. So here we have these final description. And Moses saw in the seventh heaven the holy Chayot, which support the throne of God. And he beheld also the angel Zag Zagel, the prince of the Torah and of wisdom, who teaches the Torah in 70 languages to the souls of men. And thereafter they cherish the precepts contained therein as laws revealed by God to Moses on Sinai. From this angel with the horns of glory, Moses himself learnt all the 10 mysteries. Having seen what there is in the seven heavens, he spoke to God saying, I will not leave the heavens unless you grant me a gift. And God replied, I will give you the Torah and men shall call it the law of Moses. Wow, so that is, uh... An, an understanding of why um, why Moses uh, why it's called the, the law of Moses because Moses said you're going to give me something okay well here it says that Moses essentially got the Torah from his negotiation of going to heaven so look this is this is a midrash or I would say even again the full version of this is not in most of the midrashic sources it's in it's in pseudepigrapha. It's in sources that the rabbis drew on, and most of these images do fall into uh, visions of heaven and, and later rabbinic and later rabbinic teachings. But again, the angels inhabit these different heavens and have different jobs to do in those different heavens. And as Moses goes through them and takes his tour, you know he's amazed by it. But again, at the end of the day. He only wants to take something back. And God says, you'll get the Torah. Um, which again, implies that the Torah is not the story of what happens to Moses and what we're, what we always read is the story of Moses, but that the Torah itself is like something that God gave to Moses for us, but was not just a story. Obviously it was not the story. It was, it was from heaven. It was something that God would would say is kind of the this is from heaven. This is this is what makes the world this is what makes the world will make the world uh continue. So we are gonna continue on some of these uh next week with Moses in uh paradise and uh and also he gets to see hell in next week's uh uh, portion which kind of explains why why you have to follow the Torah so you don't wind up in the bad place so everybody uh, we'll see you tomorrow night either Torah study or Thursday night for the first night of Hanukkah we have some wonderful stuff coming up and, and uh, Wendy's put together a wonderful children's service too which 
we're going to pop up there Thursday morning so that people can have that during Hanukkah. And uh, again, we'll see everybody for Hanukkah um, every night at six o'clock. And cooking, I forgot cooking too. Cooking demonstrations Monday night, six o'clock on Zoom. Everything is up on the website, but um, that'll be up there too, everybody. So happy Hanukkah in advance. Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Please everybody stay safe and stay healthy. And please, please do what you have to do to keep everyone. Quick, out. Rabbi, is Friday night service on Zoom? Is that what I saw in one of the uh, emails? At eight, eight o'clock, yeah, at eight o'clock. Yeah, thanks for saying that too. Eight o'clock, uh, it'll be on Zoom. It'll also be on uh, Facebook as we always do it, but uh, it'll be live, partly, yeah, it's live, partly live. It's partly live, partly on Zoom, partly on uh, tape. But, um, tape? Is it really on tape, huh? <laughs> Digital tape. Digital, it's in digitization somewhere in the, in the atmosphere. Well, folks, sorry for the technical difficulties. Hopefully, again, by the way, that's why we don't do services every week on Zoom, just so you know, because <laughs> this is something that uh, I was talking to some uh, canters this week saying they could not stand the glitches that they've had on, on, uh, on Zoom. That's why they're recording as much as they can. We say taping and recording, but whatever. All right, everybody. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for being here.